back to our adventure in the wonderful land of Oz. When we last left off, we had a pretty exciting part of our story because the Wicked Witch of the West has been conquered. Dorothy threw a bucket of water on her and she began to melt. So, what will happen next? Will our heroes get their wishes? We'll find out. I'm just going to check my audio settings real quick. Okay, great. Seems like we are good. <laughs> All right, so let's dive right in. So this is chapter 13 of L. Frank Baum, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. The Cowardly Lion was much pleased to hear that the Wicked Witch had been melted by a bucket of water, and Dorothy at once unlocked the gate of his prison and set him free. They went in together to the castle, where Dorothy's first act was to call all the Winkies together and tell them that they were no longer slaves. There was a great rejoicing among the Yellow Winkies, for they had been made to work hard during many years for the Wicked Witch, who had always treated them with great cruelty. They kept this day as a holiday, then and ever after, and spent the time in feasting and dancing. If our friends, if our friends the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman were only with us, said the Lion, I should be quite happy. Don't you suppose we could rescue them? asked the girl anxiously. We can try, answered the lion. So they called the yellow Winkies and asked them if they would help to rescue their friends, and the Winkies said that they would be delighted to do all in their power for Dorothy, who had set them free from bondage. So she chose a number of the Winkies, who looked as if they knew the most, and they all started away. They traveled that day and part of the next until they came to the rocky plain where the tin woodman lay, all battered and bent. His axe was near him, but the blade was rusted and the handle broken off short. The Winkies lifted him tenderly in their arms and carried him back to the yellow castle again. Dorothy, shedding a few tears, by the way, at the sad plight of her old friend, and the lion looking sober and sorry. When they reached the castle, Dorothy said to the Winkies, Are any of your people tinsmiths? Oh yes, some of us are very good tinsmiths, they told her. Then bring them to me, she said. And when the tinsmiths came, bringing the, with them all their tools and baskets, she inquired, Can you straighten out those dents in the tin woodman? Oh, <laughs> look at them go. and bend him back into shape again and, and solder him together where he is broken. The tinsmiths looked the woodman over carefully and then answered that they thought they could mend him so he would be as good as ever. So they set to work in one of the big yellow rooms of the castle and worked for three days and four nights hammering and twisting and bending and soldering and polishing and pounding at the legs and body and head of the tin woodman, until at last he was straightened out into his old form, and his joints worked as well as ever. To be sure, there were several patches on him, but the tinsmiths did a good job, and as the woodman was not a vain man, he did not mind the patches at all. When at last he walked into Dorothy's room and thanked her for rescuing him, he was so pleased that he wept tears of joy, and Dorothy had to wipe every tear carefully from his face with her apron so his joints would not be rusted. At the same time, her own tears fell thick and fast at the joy of meeting her old friend again, and these tears did not need to be wiped away. As for the lion, he wiped his so often with the tip of his tail that it became quite wet, and he was obliged to go out into the courtyard and hold it in the sun till it dried. If only had... If we only had the scarecrow with us again, said the tin woodman, when Dorothy had finished telling him everything that had happened, I should be quite happy. We must try to find him, said the girl. So she called the Winkies to help her, and they walked all that day and part of the next until they came to the tall tree and the branches of which the winged monkeys had tossed the scarecrow's clothes. It was a very tall tree 
and the trunk was so smooth that no one could climb it. But the, the woodman said at once, I'll chop it down, and then we can get the scarecrow's clothes. Now, while the tinsmiths had been work, had work mending the woodman himself, another of the Winkies, who was a goldsmith, had made an axe handle of solid gold and fitted it to the woodman's axe instead of the old broken handle. Others polished the blade until all the rust was removed and it glistened like burnished silver. As soon as he had spoken, the tin woodman began to chop and in a short time, the tree fell over with a crash when the scarecrow's clothes fell out of the branches and rolled off on the ground. Dorothy picked them up and had the Winkies carry them back to the castle, where they were stuffed with nice clean straw. And behold, here was the Scarecrow, as good as ever, thanking them over and over again for saving them. Now they were reunited. Dorothy and her friends spent a few happy days at the Yellow Castle, where they found everything they needed to make them comfortable. But one day the girl thought of Aunt Em and said, we must go back to Oz and claim his promise. Yes, said the woodman. At last I shall get my heart. And I shall get my brains, added the scarecrow joyfully. And I shall get my courage, said the lion thoughtfully. And I shall go back to Kansas, cried Dorothy, clapping her hands. Oh, let us start for the Emerald City tomorrow. This they decided to do. The next day they called the Winkies together and bade them goodbye. The Winkies were sorry to have them go, and they had grown so fond of the Tin Woodman that they begged him to stay and rule over them and the Yellow Land of the West. Finding they were determined to go, the Winkies gave Toto and the Lion each a golden collar, and to Dorothy they presented a beautiful bracelet studded with diamonds. And to the Scarecrow they gave a gold-headed head walking stick to keep him from stumbling. And to the Tin Woodman they offered a silver oil can inlaid with gold and set with precious jewels. Every one of the travelers made the Winkies a pretty speech in return and all shook hands with them until their arms ached. Dorothy went to the witch's cupboard to fill her basket with food for the journey. And there she saw the golden cap. She tried it on her own head and found that it fitted her exactly. She did not know anything about the charm of the golden cap, but she saw that it was pretty, so she made her mind to wear it and carry her sunbonnet in the basket. Then, being prepared for the journey, they all started for the Emerald City, and the Winkies gave them three cheers and many good wishes to carry with them. All right, chapter 14, The Winged Monkeys. You will remember there was no road, not even a pathway, between the castle of the Wicked Witch and the Emerald City. When the four travelers went in search of the witch, she had seen them coming, and so sent the winged monkeys to bring them to her. It was much harder to find their way back through the big fields of buttercups and yellow daisies than it was being carried. They knew, of course, they must go straight east toward the rising sun, and they started off in the right way. But at noon, when the sun was over their heads, they did not know which was east and which was west, and that was the reason they were lost in the great fields. They kept on walking, however, and at night the moon came out and shone brightly, so they lay down among the sweet-smelling yellow flowers and slept soundly until morning, all but the scarecrow and the tin woodman. The next morning the sun was behind a cloud, but they started on, as if they were quite sure which way they were going. If we walk far enough, said Dorothy, we shall some time come to some place, I am sure. But day by day passed away, and they still saw nothing before them but the yellow fields. The scarecrow began to grumble a bit. We have surely lost our way, he said, and unless we find it again in time to reach the Emerald City, I shall never get my brains. Nor I, my heart, declared the Tin Woodman. It seems to me I can scarcely wait till I get to Oz, and you must admit this is a very long journey. You see, said the cowardly lion with a whimper, I haven't the courage to keep tramping forever without getting anywhere at all. 
Then Dorothy lost heart. She sat down on the grass and looked at her companions, and they sat down and looked at her, and Toto found that for the first time in he, his life, he was too tired to chase a butterfly that flew past his head. So he put out his tongue and panted and looked at Dorothy as if to ask what they should do next. Suppose we called the field mice, she suggested. They could probably tell us the way to the Emerald City. To be sure they could, cried the scarecrow. Why didn't we think of that before? Dorothy blew the little whistle she had always carried about her neck since the queen of the mice had given it to her. In a few minutes, they heard the pattering of tiny feet, and many of the small gray mice came running up to her. Among them was the queen herself, who asked in her squeaky little voice, what can I do for my friends? We have lost our way, said Dorothy. Can you tell us where the Emerald City is? Certainly, answered the queen. But it is a great way off, for you have had it at your backs all this time. Then she noticed Dorothy's golden cap and said, Why don't you use the charm of the cap and call the winged monkeys to you? They will carry you to the city of Oz in less than an hour. I didn't know there was a charm, answered Dorothy in surprise. What is it? It is written inside the golden cap, replied the queen of the mice. But if you are going to call the winged monkeys, we must run away, for they are full of mischief and think it great fun to plague us. Won't they hurt me? asked the girl anxiously. Oh, no, they must obey the wearer of the cap. Goodbye. And she scampered out of sight with all the mice hurrying after her. Dorothy looked inside the golden cap and saw some words written upon the lining. These, she thought, must be the charm, so she read the directions carefully and put the cap upon her head. Epe, pepe, cake, she said, standing on her left foot. What did you say? asked the scarecrow, who did not know what she was doing. Hi, lo, ho, lo, hello, Dorothy went on, standing, this time on her right foot. Hello, replied the tin man, the tin woodman calmly. <laughs> zee, 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 zeek, said Dorothy, who was now standing on both feet. This ended the saying of the charm, and they heard a great chattering and flapping of wings. <laughs> As the band of winged monkeys flew to them, the king bowed low before Dorothy and asked, What is your command? We wish to go to the Emerald City, said the child, and we have lost our way. We will carry you, replied the king, and no sooner had he spoken than two of the monkeys caught Dorothy in their arms and flew away with her. Others took the scarecrow and the woodman and the lion, and one little monkey seized Toto and flew after him, although the dog tried hard to bite him. The scarecrow and the tin woodman were rather frightened at first, for they remembered how badly the winged monkeys had treated them before. But they saw no harm was intended, so they rode through the air quite cheerfully and had a fine time looking at the pretty gardens and woods far below them. Dorothy found herself riding easily between the two of the biggest monkeys, one of them the king himself. They had made a chair of their hands and were careful not to hurt her. Why do you have to obey the charm of the golden cap? she asked. That is a long story, answered the king with a laugh. But as we have a long journey before us, I will pass the time by telling you about it, if you wish. I shall be glad to hear it, she replied. Once, began the leader, we were a free people, living happily in the great forest, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts and fruit, and doing just as we pleased without calling anybody master. Perhaps some of us were rather too full of mischief at times, flying down to pull the tails of animals that had no wings, chasing birds and throwing nuts at the people who walked in the forest, but we were careless and happy and full of fun and enjoyed every minute of the day. This was many years ago, long before Oz came out of the clouds to rule over this land. There lived here then, away and at the north, a beautiful princess, who was also a powerful sorceress. All her magic was used to help the people, and she was never known to hurt anyone who was good. Her name was Ga Galette, 
and she lived in a handsome palace built from great blocks of ruby. Everyone loved her, but her greatest sorrow was that she could find no one to love in return, since all the men were much too stupid and ugly to mate with one so beautiful and wise. At last, however, she found a boy who was handsome and manly and wise beyond his years. Galette made up her mind that when he grew to be a man, she would make him her husband. So she took him to her ruby palace and used all her magic powers to make him as strong and good and lovely as any woman could wish. When he grew to manhood, Quilala, as he was called then, was said to be the best and wisest man in all the land. While his manly beauty was so great that Galette loved him dearly and hastened to make everything ready for the wedding. My grandfather was at the time the king of the winged monkeys which lived in the forest near Galette's palace and the old fellow loved a joke better than a good dinner. One day, just before the wedding, my grandfather was flying out with his band when he saw Quelala walking beside the river. He was dressed in a rich costume of pink, silk, and purple velvet, and my grandfather thought he would see what he could do. At his word, the band flew down and seized Quelala, carried him in their arms until they were over the middle of the river, and then dropped him into the water. Swim out, my fine fellow, cried my grandfather, and see if the water has spotted your clothes. Quelala was much too wise not to swim, and he was not in the least spoiled by all his good fortune. He laughed when he came to the top of the water and swam into shore. But when Galette came running out to him, she found his silks and velvet all ruined by the river. <laughs> the princess was very angry, and she knew, of course, who did it. She had all the winged monkeys brought before her, and she said at first their wings should be tied, and they should be treated as they had treated Quelala and dropped in the river. But my grandfather pleaded hard, for he knew the monkeys would drown in the river with their wings tied, and Quelala said a kind word for them also, so that Galette finally spared them, on one condition that the winged monkey should ever on one on on condition that the winged monkeys should ever after do three times the bidding of the owner of the golden cap. This cap had been made for a wedding present to Quelala, and it is said to have cost the princess half her kingdom. Of course, my grandfather and all the other monkeys at once agreed to the condition, and that is how it happens that we are three times the slaves of the owner of the golden cap, whomsoever he may be. And what became of them? asked Dorothy, who had been greatly interested in the story. Quelala being the first owner of the golden cap, replied the monkey, he was the first to lay his wishes upon us. As his bride could not bear the sight of us, he called us all to him in the forest after he had married her and ordered us to always keep where she could never again set eyes on a winged monkey, which we were glad to do, for we were all afraid of her. This was all we ever had to do until the golden cap fell into the hands of the wicked witch of the West, who made us enslave the Winkies and afterward drive Oz himself out of the land of the West. Now the golden cap is yours, and three times you have the right to lay your wishes upon us. As the Monkey King finished his story, Dorothy looked down and saw the green shining walls of the Emerald City before them. She wondered at the rapid flight of the monkeys, but was glad the journey was over. The strange creature set the travelers down carefully before the gate of the city. The king bowed low to Dorothy and then flew swiftly away, followed by all his band. That was a good, a good ride, said the little girl. Yes, and a quick way out of our troubles, replied Lion. How lucky it was you brought away that wonderful cap. <laughs> and there it is. Ah, so we, we have our one wish down. <laughs> All right, chapter 15, the discovery of Oz the Terrible. Oh no, let's find out what that means. <laughs> the four travelers walked up to the great gate of the Emerald City and rang the bell. 
After ringing several times, it was opened by the same guardian of the gate they had met before. What? Are you back again? he asked in surprise. Do you not see us? answered the scarecrow. But I thought you had gone to visit the wicked witch of the West. We did visit her, said the scarecrow. And she let you go again? asked the man in wonder. She could not help it, for she is melted, explained the scarecrow. Melted? Well, that is good news indeed, said the man. Who melted her? It was Dorothy, said the lion gravely. Good gracious, exclaimed the man, and he bowed very low indeed before her. Then he led them into his little room and locked the spectacles from the great box on all their eyes, just as he had done before. Afterward, they passed on through the gate into the Emerald City, and when the people heard from the guardian of the gate that they had melted the wicked witch of the West, they all gathered around the travelers and followed them into a great crowd to the Palace of Oz. The soldier with the green whiskers was still on guard before the door, but he let them in at once, and they were again met by the beautiful green girl, who showed each of them to their old rooms at once, so that they might rest until the great Oz was ready to receive them. The soldier had the news carried straight to Oz that Dorothy and the other travelers had come back again after destroying the wicked witch, but Oz made no reply. They thought the great wizard would send for them at once but he did not. They had no word from him the next day, nor the next, nor the next. The waiting was tiresome and wearing, and at last they grew vexed at Oz that Oz should treat them in so poor a fashion after sending them to undergo hardships and slavery. So the scarecrow at last asked the green girl to take another message to Oz, saying if he did not let them in to see him at once, they would call the winged monkeys to help them and find out whether he kept his promises or not. When the wizard was given this message, he was so frightened that he sent word for them to come to the throne room at four minutes after nine o'clock in the morning. He had once again met the winged monkeys in the land of the west. He had once met the winged monkeys in the land of the west, and he did not wish to meet them again. The four travelers passed a sleepless night, each thinking of the gift Oz had promised to bestow upon him. Dorothy fell asleep only once, and then she dreamed she was in Kansas, where Aunt Em was telling her how glad she was to have her little girl at home again. Promptly at nine o'clock the next morning, the green sol whiskered soldier came to them, and four minutes later they all went into the throne room of the great Oz. Of course, each one of them expected to see the wizard in the shape he had taken before, and all were greatly surprised when they looked about and saw no one at all in the room. They kept close to the door and closer to one another, for the stillness of the empty room was more dreadful than any of the forms they had seen Oz take. Presently, they heard a voice seeming to come from somewhere near the top of the great dome, and it said solemnly, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Why do you seek me? They looked again at every part of the room, and then, seeing no one, Dorothy asked, Where are you? I am everywhere, answered the voice, but to the eyes of common mortals I am invisible. I will now seat myself upon my throne that you may converse with me. Indeed, the voice seemed just then to come straight from the throne itself. So they walked toward it and stood in a row while Dorothy said, We have come to claim our promise, O Oz. What promise? asked Oz. You promised to send me back to Kansas when the wicked witch was destroyed, said the girl. And you promised to give me brains, said the scarecrow. And you promised to give me a heart, said the tin woodman. And you promised to give me courage, said the cowardly lion. Is the wicked witch really destroyed? asked the voice, and Dorothy thought it trembled a little. Yes, she answered. I melted her with a bucket of water. Dear me, said the voice, how sudden. Well, come to me tomorrow, for I must have time to think it over. You've had plenty of time already, said the tin woodman angrily. We shan't wait a day longer, said the scarecrow. 
You must keep your promises to us, exclaimed Dorothy. The lion thought it might be as well to frighten the wizard, so he gave a large, loud roar, which was so fierce and dreadful that Toto jumped away from him in alarm and tipped over the screen that stood in a corner. As it fell with a crash, they looked that way, and the next moment all of them were filled with wonder, for they saw, standing in just the spot the screen had hidden, a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face, who seemed to be as much surprised as they were. The tin woodman, raising his axe, rushed toward the little man and cried out, Who are you? I am the Oz, the great and terrible, said the little man in a trembling voice. But don't strike me, please, don't. I'll do anything you want me to. Our friends looked at him in surprise and dismay. I thought Oz was a great head, said Dorothy. And I thought Oz was a lovely lady, said the Scarecrow. And I thought Oz was a terrible beast, said the Tin Woodman. And I thought Oz was a ball of fire, exclaimed the Lion. No, you are all wrong, said the little man meekly. I have been making believe. Making believe, cried Dorothy. Are you not a great wizard? Hush, my dear, he said, don't speak so loud, or you will be overheard, and I shall be ruined. I'm supposed to be a great wizard. And aren't you? she asked. Not a bit of it, my dear. I'm just a common man. You're more than that, said the scarecrow in a grieved tone. You're a humbug. Exactly so, declared the little man, rubbing his hands together as if it pleased him. I am a humbug. But this is terrible, said the tin woodman. How shall I ever get my heart? Or I, my courage, asked the lion. Or I, my brains, wailed the scarecrow, wiping the tears from his eyes with his coat sleeve. My dear friends, said Oz, I pray you not to speak. Oh, here he is. <laughs> I pray you not to speak of these little things. Think of me and the terrible trouble I'm in at being found out. Doesn't anyone else know you're a humbug? asked Dorothy. No one knows it but you four, and myself, replied Oz. I have fooled everyone so long that I thought I might should never be found out. It was a great mistake my ever letting you into the throne room. Usually I will not even see my subjects, and so they believe I am something terrible. But I don't understand, said Dorothy in bewilderment. How was it that you appeared to me as a great head? That was one of my tricks, answered Oz. Step this way, please, and I will tell you about it. He led the way to a small chamber in the rear of the throne room, and they all followed him. He pointed to one corner in which lay the great head made out of many thicknesses of paper and with a carefully painted face. This I hung from the ceiling by a wire, said Oz. I stood behind the screen and pulled a thread to make the eyes move and the mouth open. But how about the voice, she inquired. Oh, I am a ventriloquist, said the little man, and I can throw the sound of my voice wherever I wish so that you thought it was coming out of the head. Here are the things I used to deceive you. He showed the scarecrow the dress and the mask he had worn when he seemed to be the lovely lady, and the tin woodman saw that his terrible beast was nothing but a lot of skin sewn together with slats to keep their, their sides out. As for the ball of fire, the false wizard had hung that also from the ceiling. It was really a ball of cotton, but when oil was poured upon it, the ball burned fiercely. Really, said the scarecrow, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for being such a humbug. I am, I certainly am, answered the little man sorrowfully, but it was the only thing I could do. Uh, sit down, please, there are plenty of chairs, and I will tell you my story. So they sat down and listened while he f told the following tale. I was born in Omaha. Why, that isn't very far from Kansas, cried Dorothy. No, but it's farther from here, he said, shaking his head at her sadly. When I grew up, I became a ventriloquist, and at that I was very well trained by a great master. I can imitate any kind of bird or beast. 
Here he mewed so like a kitten that Toto pricked up his ears and looked everywhere to see where she was. After a time, continued Oz, I tired of that and became a balloonist. What is that? asked Dorothy. A man who goes up in a balloon on circus day, so as to draw a crowd of people together and get them to pay to see the circus, he explained. Oh, she said, I know. Well, one day I went up in a balloon and the ropes got twisted so that I couldn't come down again. It went way up above the clouds so far that a current of air struck it and carried it many, many miles away. For a day and a night I traveled through the air, and on the morning of the second day I awoke and found the balloon floating over a strange and beautiful country. It came down gradually, and I was not hurt a bit, but I found myself in the midst of a strange people who, seeing me come from the clouds, thought I was a great wizard. Of course I let them think so, because they were afraid of me, and I promised to do anything I wished it in. Just to amuse myself and keep the good people busy, I ordered them to build this city in my palace, and they did it all willingly and well. Then I thought, as the country was so green and beautiful, I would call it the Emerald City, and to make the name fit better, I put green spectacles on all the people so that everything they saw was green. But isn't everything here green? asked Dorothy. No more than any other city, replied Oz. But when you wear green spectacles, why, of course, everything you see looks green to you. The Emerald City was built a great many years ago, for I was a young man when the balloon brought me here, and I am a very old man now. But my people have worn green glasses on their eyes so long that most of them think it really is an Emerald City, and it certainly is a beautiful place, abounding in jewels and precious metals, and every good thing that is needed to make one happy. I have been good to the people, and they like me, but ever since this palace was built, I have shut myself up and would not see any of them. One of my greatest fears was the witches, for while I had no magical powers at all, I soon found out that the witches were really able to do wonderful things. There were four of them in this country, and they ruled the people who live in the north and south and east and west. Fortunately, the witches of the north and south were good, and I knew they would do me no harm. But the witches of the east and west were terribly wicked, and they thought, and, and had they not thought I was more powerful than themselves, they would surely have destroyed me. As it was, I lived in deadly fear of them for many years, so you can imagine how pleased I was when I heard your house had fallen on the wicked witch of the east. When you came to me, I was willing to promise anything, if you would only do away with the other witch. But now that you have melted her, I am ashamed to say that I cannot keep my promises. I think you are a very bad man, said Dorothy. Oh no, my dear, I'm, a, I'm really a very good man, but I'm a very bad wizard, I must admit. Can't you give me brains? asked the scarecrow. You don't need them. You are learning something every day. A baby has brains, but it doesn't know much. Experience is the only thing that brings knowledge, and the longer you are on earth, the more experience you are sure to get. That may all be true, said the scarecrow, but I shall be very unhappy unless you give me brains. The false wizard looked at him carefully. Well, he said with a sigh, I'm not much of a magician, as I said, but if you will come to me tomorrow morning, I will stuff your head with brains. I cannot tell you how to use them, however. You must find that out for yourself. Oh, thank you, thank you, cried the scarecrow. I'll find a way to use them, never fear. But how about my courage? asked the lion anxiously. You have plenty of courage, I am sure, answered Oz. All you need is confidence in yourself. There is no living thing that is not afraid when it faces danger. True courage is in facing danger when you are afraid, and that kind of courage you have in plenty. Perhaps I have, but I'm scared just the same, said the lion. I shall really be very unhappy unless you give me so the sort of courage that makes one forget he is afraid. <laughs> very well, I will give you that sort of courage tomorrow, replied Oz. How about my heart? asked the Tin Woodman. Why, as for that, answered Oz, 
I think you are wrong to want a heart. It makes most people unhappy. If you only knew it, you are in luck not to have a heart. There must, that must be a matter of opinion, said the tin woodman. For my part, I will bear all the unhappiness without a murmur, if you will give me the heart. Very well, answered Oz meekly. Come to me tomorrow, and you shall have a heart. I have played wizard for so many years that I may as well continue the part a little longer. And now, said Dorothy, how am I to get back to Kansas? We shall have to think about that, replied the little man. Give me two or three days to consider the matter, and I'll try to find a way to carry you over the desert. In the meantime, you shall all be treated as my guests, and while you live in the palace, and my people will wait upon you and obey your every wish. There is only one thing I ask in return for my help, such as it is. You must keep my secret and tell no one I am a humbug. They agreed to say nothing of what they had learned and went back to their rooms in high spirits. Even Dorothy had hoped that the great and terrible humbug, as she called him, would find a way to send her back to Kansas. And if he did, that she was willing to forgive him everything. <laughs> All right, chapter 16, The Magic Art of the Great Humbug. <laughs> Next morning, the Scarecrow said to his friends, Congratulate me. I am going to Oz to get my brains at last. When I return, I shall be as other men are. I have always liked you as you were, said Dorothy simply. It, it, is kind, it is kind of you to like a scarecrow, he replied, but surely you will think more of me when you hear the splendid thoughts my new brain is going to turn out. Then he said goodbye to them, all in a cheerful voice, and went to the throne room, where he rapped upon the door. Come in, said Oz. The scarecrow went in and found the little man sitting down by the window, engaged in deep thought. I have come for my brains, remarked the scarecrow, a little uneasily. Oh, yes, sit down in that chair, please, replied Oz. You must excuse me for taking your head off, but I shall have to do it in order to put your brains in their proper place. That's all right, said the scarecrow. You are quite welcome to take my head off as long as it will be a better one when you put it on again. So the wizard unfastened his head and emptied out the straw. Then he entered the back room and took up a measure of bran, which he mixed with a great many pins and needles. Having shaken them together thoroughly, he filled the top of the scarecrow's head with the mixture and stuffed the rest of the space with straw to hold it in place. When he had fastened the scarecrow's head on his body again, he said to him, Hereafter you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of bran new brains. The Scarecrow was both pleased and proud at the fulfillment of his greatest wish, and having thanked Oz warmly, he went back to his friends. Dorothy looked at him curiously. His head was quite bulging at the top with brains. How do you feel? she asked. I feel wise indeed, he answered earnestly. When I get used to my brains, I shall know everything. Why are those needles and pins sticking out of your head? asked the tin woodman. That is proof that he is sharp, remarked the lion. Well, I must go to Oz and get my heart, said the woodman. So he walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, called Oz, and the woodman entered and said, I have come for my heart. Very well, answered the little man, but I shall have to cut a hole in your breast so I can put your heart in the right place. I hope it won't hurt you. Oh, no, answered the woodman. I shall not feel it at all. So Oz brought a pair of tinner's shears and cut a small square hole in the left side of the tin woodman's breast. Then, going to a chest of drawers, he took out a pretty heart made entirely of silk and stuffed with sawdust. Isn't it a beauty? he asked. It is indeed, replied the woodman, who was greatly pleased. But is it a kind heart? Oh, very, answered Oz. He put the heart in the woodman's breast and then replaced the square of tin, soldering it neatly together where it had been cut. There, he said, now you have a heart that any man might be proud of. 
I'm sorry I had to put a patch on your breast, but it really couldn't be helped. Never mind the patch, exclaimed the happy woodman. I am very grateful to you and shall never forget your kindness. Don't speak of it, replied Oz. Then the tin woodman went back to his friends who wished him every joy on account of his good fortune. The lion now walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, said Oz. I have come for my courage, announced the lion entering the room. Very well, answered the little man. I will get it for you. He went to the cupboard and, reaching up to a high shelf, took down a square green bottle, the contents of which we'll find out in a moment. Let's take a look at this, this illustration. Ah, so <laughs> we have our characters seemingly changed, except for Dorothy. He poured into a green gold dish, beautifully carved. Placing this before the cowardly lion, who sniffed at it as if he did not like it, the wizard said, Drink! What is it? asked the lion. Well, answered Oz, if it were inside you, it would be courage. You know, of course, that courage is always inside one, so that this really cannot be called courage until you have swallowed it. Therefore, I advise you to drink it as soon as possible. The lion hesitated no longer, but drank till the dish was empty. How do you feel now? Full of courage, replied the lion, who went joyfully back to his friends to tell him of his good fortune. Oz, left to himself, smiled to think of his success in giving the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion exactly what they thought they wanted. How can I help being a humbug, he said, when all these people make me do things that everybody knows can't be done? It was so easy to make the scarecrow and the lion and the woodman happy because they imagined I could do anything. But it will take more than imagination to carry Dorothy back to Kansas, and I'm sure I don't know how it can be done. All right, we have chapter 17. <laughs> Glad all of you are enjoying it. Thanks so much. All right, here we go. How the balloon was launched. For three days, Dorothy heard nothing from Oz. For these were sad days. These were sad days for the little girl, although her friends were all quite happy and contented. The scarecrow told the scarecrow told them there were wonderful thoughts in his head, but he would not say what they were because he knew no one could understand them but himself. When the tin woodman walked about, he felt his heart rattling around in his breast, and he told Dorothy he had discovered it to be a kinder and more tender heart than the one he had owned when he was made out of flesh. The lion declared he was afraid of nothing on earth and would gladly face any army of men or a dozen of the fierce Kalidahs. Thus, each of the little party was satisfied, except Dorothy, who longed more than ever to get back to Kansas. On the fourth day, to her great joy, Oz sent for her, and she entered the throne room. He said ple pleasantly, Sit down, my dear. I think I have found the way to get you out of this country. And back to Kansas? she asked eagerly. Well, I'm not sure about Kansas, said Oz, for I haven't the slightest notion which way it lies. But the first thing to do is cross the desert, and then it should be easy to find your way home. How can I cross the desert? she inquired. Well, I'll tell you what I think, said the little man. You see, when I came to this country, it was in a balloon. You also came through the air, being carried by a cyclone. So I believe the best way to get across the desert will be through the air. Now, it is quite beyond my powers to make a cyclone. But I've been thinking the matter over, and I believe I can make a balloon. How? asked Dorothy. A balloon, said Oz, is made of silk, which is coated with glue to keep the gas in it. I have plenty of silk in the palace, so it will be no trouble for us to make the balloon. But in all this country, there is no gas to fill the balloon with, to make it float. If it won't float, remarked Dorothy, it will be of no use to us. True, answered Oz. But there is another way to make it float, which is to fill it with hot air. Hot air isn't as good as gas, for if the air should get cold, the balloon would come down in the desert and we should be lost. We, exclaimed the girl, are you going with me? Yes, of course, replied Oz. I am tired of being such a humbug. 
If I should go out of this palace, my people would soon discover I am not a wizard, and then they would be vexed with me for having deceived them. So I have to stay shut up in these rooms all day, and it gets tiresome. I'd much rather go back to Kansas with you and be in a circus again. I shall be glad to have your company, said Dorothy. Thank you, he answered. Now, if you will help me sew the silk together, we will begin to work on our balloon. So Dorothy took a needle and thread, and as fast as Oz could cut the strips of silk into pr the proper shape, the girls sewed them neatly together. First there was a strip of light green silk, then a strip of dark green, and then a strip of emerald green, for Oz had a fancy to make the balloon in different shades of the color about them. It took three days to sew all the strips together, but when it was finished they had a big bag of green silk more than twenty feet long. Then Oz painted it on the inside with a coat of thin glue to make it airtight, after which he announced that the balloon was ready. But we must have a basket to ride in, he said. So he sent the soldier with the green whiskers for a big clothes basket, which he fastened with many ropes to the bottom of the balloon. When it was all ready, Oz sent word to his people that he was going to make a visit to a great brother wizard who lived in the clouds. The news spread rapidly throughout the city, and everyone came to see the wonderful sight. Oz ordered the balloon carried out in front of the palace, and the people gazed upon it with much curiosity. The tin woodman had chopped a big pile of wood, and now he made a fire of it, and Oz held the bottom of the balloon over the fire so that the hot air that arose from it would be caught in the silken bag. Gradually, the balloon swelled out and rose into the air until finally the basket just touched the ground. Then Oz got into the basket and said to all the people in a loud voice, I am now going away to make a visit. While I am gone, the scarecrow will rule over you. I command you to obey him as you would me. The balloon was by this time tugging hard at the rope that it held to the ground, for the air within it was hot, and this made it so much lighter in weight than the air without than the air without that it pulled so, so let's see. <laughs> let's go. It was so much lighter in weight than the air without that it pulled hard to rise into the sky. That was a difficult sentence, sorry about that. <laughs> Come, Dorothy, cried the wizard. Hurry up, or the balloon will fly away. I can't find Toto anywhere, replied Dorothy, who did not wish to leave her little dog behind. Toto had run into the crowd to bark at a kitten, and Dorothy at last found him. She picked him up and ran toward the balloon. She was in the, within a few steps of it, and Oz was holding out his hands to help her into the basket when, crack, when the, went the ropes, and the balloon, balloon rose into the air without her. Come back, she screamed. I want to go too. I can't come back, my dear, called Oz from the basket. Goodbye, goodbye, shouted everyone, and all eyes were turned upward to where the wizard was riding in the basket, rising every moment farther and farther into the sky. And that was the last any of them ever saw of Oz, the wonderful wizard, though he may have reached Omaha safely and be there now for all we know. But the people remembered him lovingly and said to one another, Oz was always our friend. When he was here, he built for us this beautiful emerald city, and now he is gone. He has left the wise scarecrow to rule over us. Still, for many days they grieved over the loss of the wonderful wizard and would not be comforted. All right, I believe this will be our last chapter for the day. I don't want to scrub forward to see how much longer we have left, but let's try to finish this chapter today, and we'll see. So this is chapter 18, Away to the South. <laughs> Dorothy wept bitterly at the passing of her hope to get home to Kansas again, but when she thought of it all over, she was glad she had not gone up in a balloon, and she also felt sorry at losing Oz, and so did her companions. The Tin Woodman came to her and said, Truly, I should be ungrateful if I failed to mourn for the man who gave me my lovely heart. I should like to cry a little because Oz is gone, and if you will kindly wipe, wipe away my tears so that I shall not rust. With pleasure, she answered. 
and brought a towel at once. Then the tin woodman wept for several minutes, and she watched the tears carefully, watched the tears carefully and wiped them away with a towel. When he had finished, he thanked her kindly and oiled himself thoroughly with his jeweled oil can to guard against mishap. The Scarecrow was now the ruler of the Emerald City, and although he was not a wizard, the people were proud of him. For, they said, there is not another city in all the world that is ruled by a stuffed man. And so far as they knew, they were quite right. The morning after the balloon had gone up with Oz, the four travelers met in the throne room and talked matters over. The Scarecrow sat in the big throne and the others stood respectfully before him. We are, we are not so unlucky, said the new ruler, for this palace and the Emerald City belong to us and we can do just as we please. When I remember that a short time ago I was up on a pole in a farmer's cornfield and that I am now the ruler of this beautiful city, I am quite satisfied with my lot. I also, said the Tin Woodman, am well pleased with my new heart, and really that was the only thing I wished in all the world. For my part, I am content in knowing I am as brave as any beast that ever lived, if not braver, said the lion modestly. <clears throat> if Dorothy would only be contented to live, oh, and here's, here's our friends, <laughs> here he is in his throne. Contented in the Emerald City, continued Scarecrow, we might all be happy together. But I don't want to live here, cried Dorothy. I want to go to Kansas and live with Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. Well then, what can be done, inquired the woodman. The Scarecrow decided to think, and he thought so hard that the pins and needles began to stick out of his brain. Finally, he said, why not call the winged monkeys and ask them to carry you over the desert? I never thought of that, said Dorothy joyfully. It's just the thing. I'll go at once for the golden cap. When she brought it into the throne room, she spoke the magic words, and soon the band of winged monkeys flew in through an open window and stood beside her. This is the second time you have called us, said the winged king, or, so the monkey king, bowing before the little girl. What do you wish? I want you to fly with me to Kansas, said Dorothy. But the monkey king shook his head. That cannot be done, he said. We belong to this country alone and cannot leave it. There has never been a winged monkey in Kansas yet, and I suppose there never will be, for they don't belong there. We shall be glad to serve you in any way in our power, but we cannot cross the desert. Goodbye. And with another bow, the monkey king spread his wings and flew away through the window, followed, followed by all his band. Dorothy was almost ready to cry with disappointment. I have wasted the charm of the golden cat to no purpose, she said, for the winged monkeys cannot help me. It is certainly too bad, said the tender-hearted woodman. The scarecrow was thinking again, and his head bulged out so horribly that Dorothy feared it would burst. Let us call in the soldier with the green whiskers, he said, and ask his advice. So the soldier was summoned and entered the throne room timidly, for while Oz was alive, he never was allowed to come further than the door. This little girl, said the scarecrow to the soldier, wishes to cross the desert. How can she do so? I cannot tell, answered the soldier, for nobody has ever crossed the desert unless it is Oz himself. Is there no one who can help me? asked Dorothy earnestly. Glinda might, he suggested. Who is Glinda? inquired the Scarecrow. The Witch of the South. She is the most powerful of all the witches and rules over the quadlings. Besides, her castle stands on the edge of the desert, so she may know a way to cross it. Glinda is a good witch, isn't she? asked the child. The quadlings think she is good, said the soldier, and she is kind to everyone. I have heard that Glinda is a beautiful woman who knows how to keep young in spite of the many years she has lived. How can I get to her castle? asked Dorothy. The road is straight to the south, he answered, but it is said to be full of dangers to travelers. There are wild beasts in the woods and a race of queer men who do not like strangers to cross their country. For this reason, none of the quadlings ever come to the Emerald City. The soldier then left them and the scarecrow and said, 
It seems, in spite of dangers, that the best thing Dorothy can do is to travel to the land of the South and ask Glinda to help her. For, of course, if Dorothy stays here, she will never get back to Kansas. You must have been thinking again, remarked the Tin Woodman. I have, said the Scarecrow. I shall go, I shall go with Dorothy, declared the Lion, for I am tired of your city and long for the woods and the country again. I am really a wild beast, you know. Besides, Dorothy will need someone to protect her. That is true, agreed the Woodman. My axe may be of service to her, so I also will go with her to the land of the South. When shall we start? asked the Scarecrow. Are you going? they asked in surprise. Certainly. If it wasn't for Dorothy, I should never have had brains. She lifted me from the pole in the cornfield and brought me to the Emerald City. So my good luck is all due to her, and I shall never leave her until she starts back to Kansas for good and all. Thank you, said Dorothy gratefully. You are all very kind to me, but I should like to start as soon as possible. We shall go tomorrow morning, replied, returned the Scarecrow. So now let us all get ready, for it will be a long journey. All right, perfect timing. So I, I imagine that we will finish the book tomorrow. Um, I haven't looked ahead, so I'm not exactly sure. I know we're reaching our conclusion, so let's hope that they make it uh, all the way to Glinda and that hopefully Dorothy can make her way back home. So we'll see how far we get tomorrow. And then once we finish the book, we'll have uh, another stream to talk about the differences between the movie and the book and to give you some historical context since the movie was produced uh, much later, about 40 or so years later uh, than the book. So different, different eras. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed this reading. This is a really fun story. I love sharing the story time with you. And if you can, uh, we do appreciate any donations that you can make to the History Center at this time. We don't have our usual streams coming in of, of revenue from our lots and lots of field trips and visitors coming to see our awesome exhibits. So we're super happy to do these live streams. But like many nonprofits, hey, we're kind of in a in a uncomfortable position right now. So uh, anything that you can offer is really appreciated right now. But we're super happy to do all of these live streams. It's been it's been really good for us too. So until tomorrow, uh, we I hope that you will be safe and healthy, and we will continue our adventure then. Thanks for listening today. Mm -hmm.